Well, a work, work, a warm uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, this is our last day, but uh, we still have some interesting conversations for our last day. Let's talk about the cities, the cities of the future. Indeed, uh, let's talk about the cities where we live. Uh, we can talk about Rio. It's a huge city, a big city. Um, I think it's the beginning of our conversation, but um, it's not the only goal that we have here in the afternoon. Um, I have with me Camila and Teresa. I think it's better than one and other. They can introduce uh, and tell the organizations that they manage. And uh, it's the beginning of our conversation. I will start with you. I think that we have a problem with your microphone. Is my, mine is working. Maybe I can start. <laughs> your, yours is, is OK. Hi, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for, for being here today. My name is Camila Jordan, and I work at Tetu Brazil uh, as the executive director. And Tetu is an organization that works together with uh, favelas and their residents and young volunteers in search for concrete solutions for the challenges that these communities face. Uh, and today, I think it's, it's important for us to be here because uh, we know that in our society, there is a tendency for, 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 for us to talk in, in bubbles and not to consider the entire of society. And when we're talking about the future of cities, the future of climate change and how that will impact our lives, we have to look at the most vulnerable communities uh, in our countries and, and especially in Brazil and Latin America. So I think today we're here to talk a little bit from, from that perspective, from the work that we do and how we should, even in an event where we're talking about future and uh, so much technology, how is this technology actually used in favor of the future that we want to build, that we want to see? Thank you so much. Uh, Can everyone I, hear me now? Let's see if your microphone is already. Can you hear me now? Not um, yet. I, I, no? I, I will ask our technician team to, I can just to maybe, uh, change it. No, no, now it's working. Yeah? No? You can hear me? Okay, great. You, okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm Teresa Williamson. Um, it's an honor to be here yeah. uh, with everyone. Um, I'm executive director of Catalytic Communities, which is a nonprofit that works also with favela communities. We focus... You, you, you made a similar work. Uh... Yeah, we, well, well, quite different, actually. So Teatu, Camila's organization, as she pointed out, they work with volunteers to support favelas that are in a particularly precarious state to provide uh, basic housing to people who don't have basic housing. Our organization, Catalytic Communities, we specifically support consolidated favelas. So these are neighborhoods that have been around often for generations where residents have built up their communities over time and where residents want to stay and continue improving their neighborhoods. Um, so Catalytic Communities has three major areas of action. We'd work with narrative. So how many of you here have been to a favela? Raise your hands. Well, there are a lot. Excellent. It's our public, Excellent. It's our public yeah. here. Um, a couple, maybe 15 years ago, a volunteer of ours in New York went around asking people in the street if they'd been to favelas. It was a very small sample size, but she found that the 90% of people who had actually been to favelas had a positive image of these communities, even abroad, which was almost the polar opposite of people who hadn't been to favelas. So part of our work is around understanding these communities, creating nuance and uh, improving the narrative. Another part of our work is around building sustainable projects. So we have uh, an organ a network called the Sustainable Favela Network with hundreds of organizers who do solar, community museums, uh, green roofs, and they're trying to basically develop their favelas in a sustainable way. And then finally, we also work around land rights uh, with a favela community land trust project. And so we can talk about that later. Okay. Yeah. Let's do it. Theresa, it's not in our grid, but tell me, what what uh, are changing in these 15 years? Because you are telling that 15 years ago the, the situation was a little bit well, well, was very different. What what are the changing in this? If we can make a oh. uh, yeah, so a well, timeline. well, our, what, so what we the we've difference? we've been working with favelas in Rio for 24 years total, and there has uh, been a huge evolution in that period. 
mostly because of community investment, so residents improving their own homes over time, also because of communications access, social media, um, federal affirmative action programs that mean that young people from favelas are increasingly accessing universities. Uh, but there are uh, thousands of community organizations in Rio's favelas, and that sort of network of civil society only grows stronger from year to year. Okay. Um, Camille, in your perspective, when we are talking about the cities of the future, uh, what we are talking about, uh, if we imagine a city of the future, uh, what we are talking about? Can so I think, in first to, to, for us to have a little bit of context, Latin America in special, uh, and Brazil is one of the most urbanized countries in the world, meaning that 86% of people in Brazil already live in urban centers. So we are already the future, even if we're yeah, considering we, we other are places the of the planet. Right That's uh, the and so when we're talking about the future and about sustainability and what these cities should continually evolving for, for them to look like what we want, we really need to consider um, that we don't reproduce the problems that we already have. That we really look for solutions and that technology and resources uh, and that is something that we believe in and Tattoo is that we should start by the most vulnerable communities. Because if we start with the people that are currently not having any access to any basic rights, uh, and that is one of the interesting differences between our work with uh, Therese and me, is that Tattoo focuses really on the communities that are, um, where 40% from our data at Tattoo live in wooden shacks. This means that people don't have the basic right, they don't sleep, they can't sleep, they're afraid of what will happen at any time with their home, and that creates all sorts of problems in your day-to-day -day life, of course, if you don't have a safe space uh, to be. And so when we're talking about the future of cities, we really, and the other day I saw something really interesting online, which was um, everything, when we see movies about the future of cities, Star Wars and everything, we were looking at all these images where the cities are gray and there's like no, no, no green and yeah. flying cars and everything. <laughs> And then there was this the provocation of, some, and, and, we, and if we ask AI, and someone asked AI, what would cities look like in the future if they were actually sustainable? And it was this really f funny image that we never actually see of all this green and like robots interacting in a very green space and actually helping people out in a, in a more sustainable and, and just way. So I think the first thing that starts is how, how, what are we imagining? Because if we are imagining just flying cars and pizza being delivered uh, by drones and things like that, how we're, we're not talking about things that are still so basic as basic sanitation. I mean, in Brazil, over 50% of people still don't have access to basic sanitation. So we really need to use all of the resources and all of our knowledge towards solving the problems that have been around for centuries. Because if we don't do that, we'll just keep going in the same direction. And I think that's also, why it's so important to have spaces like this here today. We're definitely not in the, in the tech world as maybe other people are, but it is important that we, we pierce that bubble and really talk about how we use all those resources towards uh, creating these cities that in, are inclusive for all, because today they're not. Well, we, we the people, we the citizens, we need to do the right things, of course. But do you think that the politicians, um, they think that they need to take the to took the right decisions about uh, what uh, they need to do about the future or uh, it's not a, a key point for them so i'll well, talk a little it, bit to it's this a, it's an yeah open yeah question. well so i'm an urban planner and i i studied at the university of pennsylvania and so I studied the exact same curriculum or very similar to what urban planners all over the world study and what they're trying to implement all over the world. And we know that our cities are becoming more and more similar in many ways and not more and more unique. And I would actually ask everyone here, what do you value in a city? Those of you who love cities, what is it that you love about a city? Is it the spontaneous interaction? Is it the unique na nature of neighborhoods? Is it communities? Because usually what we love about cities are things that come from the people who grew up there. They're the people who built the city, they're the communities who physically built the city, who built its culture. In our case here in Rio, it's the favelas that basically provide the culture of the city. Uh, and um, 
urban and and politicians often go to this level of expertise that ignores all of this knowledge at the grassroots. And so we're our cities are becoming more and more sterile. Um, and going back to Camila's point, if we actually thought about our cities from the perspective of centering the people who are most vulnerable in our plans, we would naturally be building cities better for everyone. So if, we, if, if politicians invested in those communities, but not top down, not what urban planners think need to be doing, but what communities need to do. Um, you know, if you, if you go to a favela, community meeting in a favela uh, with public officials, typically the top three demands are uh, sanitation, education, and health care. It's almost universal. And housing. But those are not where the investments are. Even though, think pandemic, those are exactly the three things we needed. Communities know, they have the knowledge, they already know what needs to be done. In fact, they're doing it. They're building those things in the absence of government. That's what informal settlements are at their heart. And so we need to find ways to see that, value that, support that, Fun and it. then build our cities from there. Uh, in a way, you, you answered to the question, mm. how the cities of the future look like it's uh, i think that's part of the the answer is, is already there um when we talking about the cities of the future let me just um put something on, on the table first time that i come to rio well many many years ago i think that i was a teenager uh, i asked the guy that is driving the car i, I was uh, watching the favelas and i asked well there is a plan to to, to put everything down and to build something And the guy says with, in a way, totally, no, there is no plan. There is no plan. And well, that, it was 30 years ago. And indeed, there is no plan. So we still have the favelas. We have more people on the favelas. And that's the future in a city like Rio or Sao Paulo or even in other places or, or, or of Latin America. So we need to live with that. For, for, for you, it's clear, it's clear that we need to live Absolutely. It. No, not only we need to live with it, we need to value it and see how we can support communities' development. And to um, help them. So the, exactly. To help we community... To help well, obviously, people. communities need to continue their development with support. But you're not going to er eradicate 1.4 million people who live in neighborhoods. Many favelas in Rio are, at this point, historic neighborhoods. There are 27 favela museums or memory projects in Rio Does your neighborhood have a museum? Have residents of your neighborhood taken the time to create a museum to preserve the memory of the neighborhood? We have 27 favelas with that characteristic in Rio, and it's a growing movement. So at this point, many of these are historic neighborhoods. There's an important, his, you know, many of you are, how many of you are from Rio? Raise your hand. Okay. So people from Rio hopefully will know this history. Other people may not, right? So Rio was the largest point of entry for enslaved Africans in history. Uh, just the city of Rio received five times the number of enslaved people as the entire United States. And that history is directly related to why favelas exist and continue, and they will continue because they are, they have become essentially the ancestral communities of these, of, of, of formerly enslaved people's descendants. Many favelas want to preserve themselves as historic neighborhoods. And that's a growing movement in the favelas. And, and so what you need to do is find ways to help them develop fully without losing that history. Just, just recently, actually, in Brazil, we changed back the name that we used in, in our census back to favelas. It used to be favelas in the early 2000s. It changed to subnormal agglomerates, yeah. which was horrible, let's say, and now it's back to favelas. So even just giving that name is, is an important step to actually recognizing these territories. And I mean, in Brazil, we have currently, you talked a little bit about Rio, but in Brazil, there's over 16 million people who live uh, in favelas. And that number is probably subdimensionated uh, as we speak. So of course, there's a need to, to really look at, 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 at the communities and understand Because, I mean, there, today there are people who are living in situations that are really not safe. And we know that. And Brazil knows that very well because year after year we have uh, the consequences of the climate crisis and they're the hardest hit 
So we really need to look at, at, at the adaptation for, for the communities. And as Teresa said, the knowledge is there. The, the funding is not there. And the focus and the continued focus over time, it needs to be there. So for example, uh, if people are familiar with the terms of social urbanism, which is something that people are more and more uh, talking about, it actually was uh, an idea that started in Rio in the 90s with one program called Favela Bairro. And then it was discontinued. People from Medellin and Colombia came to Rio, understood the idea of the program, took it back to Colombia. And Medellin, which was one of the most um, violent cities in the world with the highest murder rates, is now an example of urbanism uh, from an idea that was taken from here. And there they could actually, they had a plan, 20 year long plan that has been over time continued. And the strongest part of that program, why it worked over so many decades, is because it was from the bottom up. It was because the citizens had such a strong participation and everyone understood that even if the government changed, the program needed to continue. And that's what we still don't have in Brazil. We have very few examples of social, of what we call urban social integration of the favelas. I mean, the other day I was reading, uh, Complexo, Complexo do Alemão has, has, uh, has been incorporated into a city as a neighborhood and it still has structural issues that have been going on for 50 years. So we really actually need also to make the right choices and vote for people who understand the, that we need to focus on in these territories. And if, if we don't, our cities will forever be segregated and forever become more and more sterile. Uh, and actually, it will be horrible for everyone to live. I mean, who wants to live in the, in the condo that you just you don't enjoy the city at all. You go in with your car, you come out with your car, you go to the shopping center. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> we are here in Baja where everyone <laughs> lives like that, but I personally prefer to walk around, to enjoy, enjoy the city in the bike, feel so, safe on the, the streets. people live inside the car, inside the house and inside exactly. the car. Exactly, and I mean, for our health is horrible. We don't walk, we yeah. breathe air that is totally polluted. We don't, we don't see people, we don't enjoy each other, so. We have more or less five minutes in the house. Uh, you talk about uh, the climate crisis. Well, it's an issue that is on the table every day. Um, there is, in your perspective, what is the relationship to solving the, the housing crisis and the climate crisis? They are connected? Yeah, I think it's an extension of what we've been talking about already, but our house, right? Well, theoretically, our home is shelter. When you think about human needs, what is the home? It's shelter providing your safety from the climate. That's the number one use in that, right? Um, sadly, we're build, building our cities increasingly where housing is about creating speculative goods. And that is at a total juxtaposition with housing as shelter. And as a consequence, we have situations of precariousness. You have increasing, here in Rio, we've got um, water access is actually on the, the decline, not the increase. In favelas at the moment, we're hearing more and more uh, communities uh, left days without water. Um, we actually did a study. Uh, anyone who, oh, by the way, anyone who's interested, Alini from our team has a lot of material. She's raising her hand over there. But we did a study called Water and Energy Justice in the Favelas. 15 communities uh, developed the indicators, did the study door to door. And what we're seeing is that basically the services are not improving. Basic services are getting worse in favelas. You're getting more people with flooding and the flooding is getting worse year to year. So we're the very opposite of what we needed. And um, Camila mentioned that resources aren't available. Sometimes they actually are, but they're not accessed. So there have been federal funds set aside for over 12 years for landslide containment in favelas, which the city of Rio still has not you. sent their, you know, their, their letter up to, to the federal government requesting. And so it's just been sitting there for 12 years. So sometimes it is neglect or it is, uh, you know, lack of priorities or, or looking the other way or thinking about different parts of the city as where investments should happen and not the areas that most need it. Well, from, from our perspective, we, I mean, our, our name of our organization is TETU, which means roof. Uh, and we work from the perspective that housing is the right that sustains all other rights. Even by the UN, if you think about what is adequate housing, it starts 
with, uh, with the house, with the shelter, and then it goes to all the services and everything that is uh, uh, together with, with the house. So if we started looking at and actually prioritizing housing, because we don't even have a national plan for housing. And housing, you can solve the housing crisis, and that's the crisis that's going on all over the world without uh, actually having a comprehensive plan that looks at people who are living uh, in, in, on, on the streets, people who are paying too much rent, people who live in houses that don't have the ad adequate conditions, people who live in wooden shacks. I mean, today we're just leaving people, they've been living in wooden shacks and they will continue to live on wooden shacks because they don't have any other access. They can't access Mia Casa Mia Vida, they can't access other rent, for example, stabilizing programs. So we really need a comprehensive plan that looks at it. And, and housing can be that focus point uh, for the crisis exactly because it also needs to adapt to the conditions that are coming and that are already here. Well, we have two minutes. Let's go to, I, I would say, to a final take. Sometimes we said yesterday the future was better, but uh, regarding our, um, the, the issue that we discussed here this afternoon, your final take about the cities of the future. Well, as a woman who works with Afro-Brazilian communities, um, the past is not better than the present. Uh, as an environmentalist, I might think otherwise. Um, but I think that what we need to do is we need to be thinking about how cities can integrate with our ancestral knowledge. And in terms of technology, how technology can support that rather than create this futuristic city that's actually not very human. Ultimately, we're animals. Ultimately, we need to connect with other humans. Um, I know the blue zones, right? The blue zones are the parts of the world where people live longest, and there are all these studies now on centenarians, and they're finding that the number one thing is human connection. What makes people live healthy, long lives is connection, relationship with other humans. So we need to be building cities where we value those connections and where the communities that most build connection, like favelas, where you see this very strong social fabric, are allowed to maintain and strengthen that social fabric over generations. Thank you, Teresa. Your final take, Camilo. I think if uh, there's one thing that you can remember from everything that we talked about here today is actually what is the meaning of your house for you on your day-to-day -day life and how, how that is so important to every challenge that you face on, uh, on, your, on your lives and how everyone actually should be, should be able to access uh, that, that, uh, that right. So if we're thinking about the future, we really need to start with something that is sustainable for all and starting with the people who are now already suffering the hardest consequences of the cri climate crisis and the social crisis and an economic crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Thanks.